So this is what a typical sand tray would look like. Oftentimes we see when, when kids are playing, right, they'll be all in it. Maybe they're climbing over stuff, but then they'll stop and just kind of notice the yeah. feel of the sand going through their hands. Am I taking my child to therapy <laughs> and you're just playing with them? Is that really therapy? Hey everyone, thanks for joining us. Today we're going to talk about one of my favorite subjects and maybe part of the reason why I got into the field of therapy is play therapy. Um, I, I It's one of my favorite interventions in working with youth, primarily youth, but I'm not going to lie, I've used it with adults some yeah. too. And so uh, with me, I have one of our child and family therapists, Megan Roach. She's a part of our team at Arizona Family Counseling and Christian Family Care. And so I love doing play therapy, and I think there's a lot of great reasons why we do play therapy. But I think sometimes people will come into it with like, um, are, am I taking my child to therapy <sighs> And you're just playing with them? Is that really therapy? Right. And so I think people a lot of times will have questions mm -hmm. about that that are legitimate questions. And so, Megan, would you share just a little bit about kind of in your perspective, like what is play therapy? Sure. Um, play therapy is really just using toys and play material to help a child create change, create understanding, yeah. process their thoughts, their feelings distressing moments they've, ex they've had. Yeah. So they're not able to have, so a child's ability to have that, those verbal skills, they're not there yet as adults yeah. are. Yeah. And so they don't have that abstract reasoning. They're looking at where their brain development is at. They're still in that early stage. And mm -hmm. so they're not able to really reason with what's going on, the events they've had, the traumatic situations they've experienced. Yeah. And so play therapy just allows kids to meet them where they're at and allow them to process in their own timing, however that looks like. Yeah. Using what they're so used to, which is playing. Yeah. And I think playing is so important in the early stages of development. Oh yeah. Yeah. It 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 is such a powerful thing. And we see like play has so many just developmental benefits, right? And so, yeah. and, and the thing is, is, to your point, right? Like they can have, uh, they might be able to use their words, but there's like this idea of like, can I express what is going on inside of me that they just sometimes cannot do, sure. right? Like they can't say, right, I, I want to feel loved and cherished, mm. or I want to connect deeply with someone. Yeah. They might not have the ability to say something like that, but man, you get like a cute little doll out like like this one. Yeah. This is one of the ones I've used um, in play therapy, right? Where it's just going, I want to care for mm -hmm. something that's adorable and delight in it. And so sometimes even using things that just kind of draw out some of these natural play therapy kind of techniques and actions, yeah. right? Like I think it just hits at something that you couldn't with a five-year-old or a seven-year-old with words, but giving them something, it's like, yeah, they want to nurture and connect with it. It's yeah. like, isn't it amazing? I love that. Yeah. yeah. Play is, is their language. Yeah. That is their way yeah. to communicate. Just like the way we're communicating is because we're able to articulate yeah. what we're experiencing. Our brain development has grown. Yeah. But they're communicating through playing. Mm. That is their language. That yeah. is the way that that is their quote unquote words yeah. per se. Yeah. And so I think that's why it's so important that play therapy is used with younger generation and younger kids is because yeah. those are their words. So a hundred percent agree. And so kind of thinking about, okay, so play is kind of their language. How does it all work? Yeah. Right. And, and, and how do you see it working? In the therapy session. Yeah. So there's two different frameworks of play therapy. Okay. Um, there's that non-directive and then there's directive play. Okay. And so I will use interchangeably both types of frameworks. Yeah. Um, and they're used at different times for different reasons. And so usually in the beginning, um, I will just engage with non-directive play, okay. which is you're using more child-centered. And so the child is 
directly choosing the toys they want to play with. Mm. And so the therapist is more of the observer and they're picking up on the themes and the placement of toys or the way they're interacting with the toys. Yeah. So if they grab um, the policeman and they grab a kid mm. and a kid runs away, maybe there's some fear there. Yeah. Maybe there's some deeper, you know, events that have happened that the way they're interacting. And so the non-directive play is allowing the therapist to kind of observe versus directive is where maybe the therapist is choosing a specific toy, choosing Mm. how they want the child to interact because there's um, specific maybe skills they want to work on or maybe they want to process. Maybe they, so for me, I will use maybe um, directive in, I want to really work on mastery or yeah. I really want to process an event that happened. Yeah. yeah. And so I will kind of use that interchangeably based off of where they're at. Maybe it's really working on the child parent connection. Mm, yeah. And so that would be appropriate to use more directive because the therapist is facilitating the parent and the child like to work on that attachment, yeah. to work yeah. on that bond, to work on something that may be missing or needed to be, you know, increased yeah. in the relationship. So that would be the appropriate time. And I, I love that, right? So it's like you can use the same therapy tools and it can be directive and non-directive. So I'll go, go back to my little zebra buddy here, right? A directive thing could be I'm mom, uh, child, I want you to take care of little Mm. zebra baby together, right? And so you're directing them to do something and maybe you have different kind of blankets or baby bottles or different things like that where they're nurturing something together, right? And you're in some ways directing, but then you're allowing them to kind of work through that in their own way. Um, Or it could be, all right, pick a toy, right? And we're going to, we're going to play with it and we're seeing what kind of themes come out of that, sure. right? Like, and so that it's so interesting how you can use toys in different ways to kind of both be both directive and non-directive. Yeah. So up on here, I see we have a board or it looks like a game yes. set, the emotion roller coaster. Um, and so this to me tends to be more of like, like kind of like a directive. And so for those of you out there, here's just a game that's like other games that we might be maybe use that are more commonly known. So how might you use emotional roller coaster in therapy? Yeah. Yeah. So the way that I kind of will start off with talking about emotion awareness yeah. is explaining that emotions, they go up and down. Yeah. We have so many diff- different emotions. Yeah. Kind of like a stoplight. We have the green, which is the happy. Yeah. Really yeah. excited. Then we have the yellow, which is more of the, the harder emotions, yeah, the, yeah. the nervousness, yeah, the ones that yeah. we kind of get stuck in our in our tummy that we were like, I don't know what I feel right now. I love that, yeah. And then yeah. we have the red, which is angry, yeah, or yeah. the the bigger emotions that we say. And so I kind of explain it that way, and I kind of explain that emotions are kind of like a roller coaster. We mm-hmm. go up and down. Yeah, it's not always the same. Sometimes we'll have those big emotions. But when we'll come down. Yeah. Sometimes it can be really scary. Yeah. Then we'll come down. Yeah. And then we'll go back and forth. And so I will use that with this game of talking about emotions. Okay. And allowing them to, there, so it, in this game, we kind of have some mindfulness and some mm. coping yeah. cards. Yeah. And so the coping cards allows us to kind of understand how can I cope when I have this big emotion? Mm. Maybe I'm at the, the red light. Yeah. Thinking of a stoplight. Yeah. Maybe I'm having those big emotions. How do I cope with that? Mm. Or how can I cope even with the big, um, the small emotions, the yeah. happy emotions? Yeah. What does that feel like? And it uses some somaticness so that we're really becoming more attuned with our body. Okay. So and that's like with somatic, kind of more bodily. Bodily. Yep. So. Yeah. Where do we feel those emotions? Yeah. Do we feel it in our tummy? Do we feel it? Does it kind of feel like a knot in our throat sometimes? Yeah. What? Do we notice? How do we know that we get really scared? <laughs> yeah. Do we notice? Yeah. Does our face turn red? Yeah. Does it feel hot? And so this game will kind of go through that. Mm. And then we can practice kind of down-regulating. Yeah. 
Yeah, I love that, right? Like, and so this is just, again, some kids might love that, right? Yeah. And it's like they, which might be uh, some what relying verbally, but then we see other things like, for instance, your sand, the kinetic sand, which by the way, I love the kinetic sand stuff, right? Like it's just so mm -hmm. fun, like in a tactile way, I'm kind of mm -hmm. a fidgeter. Um, and so how might you use like the kinetic sand to build skills or like how might you integrate that in therapy? Yeah. So kinetic sand is great for, I use it a lot for sensory processing. Okay. Um, and just more of the working on that sensory, sensory motor. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, this is sense, scented. So it smells scented. like, Ooh. smells like cupcakes. Okay. And kids right. love cupcakes. Do kids try to eat it? Because it they have like not that. yet. Okay. Cause it's like, usually it's like, it smells good. Right. <laughs> but it's okay. So it smells yeah. like cupcakes. So there's like sensory, but then also like the touch, but right? The touch. Yeah. And so, um, a lot of kids will use, I will use this and kind of process what is what does the sand feel like mm. do we notice anything what yeah is, what is it is it bumpy it kind of practice that mindfulness yeah yeah with it and then some kids who have a lot of aggression who really have so much anger maybe we can squeeze it really mm. tight yeah yeah what does it feel like when we squeeze it really tight right and then we release it yeah i love that so it's like there's multifaceted kind of uh, skill building concepts mm -hmm. going on in there, right? Like one, we all have this, um, have these needs, yeah. right? Like to kind of sensory needs, like getting energy out, getting emotions out, right? And sometimes we don't have the best ways of doing that, but yeah. even finding things like sand to kind of get it out, great way to kind of go, look, you can get your needs met without having to punch someone or, right? Yeah. Like, and, but then the other thing is the, you mentioned kind of like the mindfulness piece. Yeah. And for those of you out there, like one of the best ways to help someone regulate their emotions is through what we call kind of like this grounding mm -hmm. where I'm going, okay, I'm getting out of my feelings and I'm really kind of like focusing on a sensation yes, and just making my world smaller. And I'm not worried about everything else that's kind of around me, but I'm just focused on something like sand. Kids do this really well with novel things. And so you, there might be something novel that the kids are like just excited and in love with in the therapy yeah. office. And people are going, okay, great. Well, I can, I can buy these things and put them in my home, but there's something about the novelty of going to a therapy office, having a space that is used for working through emotions and whatnot. And yeah. then it's like, we're introducing these things that are really preparing them and really paving neural pathways for doing good work in therapy. Yeah. And that's why I partly, I like scented is because yeah. we use our senses Yeah, and thinking from a trauma informed approach is a, our senses are, we use our senses. Sometimes yeah. we think of, there's a certain scent that reminded us of something mm -hmm. and we can kind of work through that. And so that. it reminds me, the scent reminds them of cooking with their grandma mm. that provided such safety Yeah, or maybe it was something else. And so we can kind of process through that and I can see kind of the way they're interacting with that yeah. or the way they, maybe they don't like cupcakes. Maybe yeah. there's something there. Yeah. Maybe they reminded them of something. And that gives me a better understanding of, okay, what, what, that can kind of prompt more of yeah. a, a deeper understanding about what is there. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Thank you again for just kind of sharing some of that. We also kind of have a, a setup here with these toys. And so a lot of times we might do things kind of sand tray related where it's kind of, you create a world and usually it's like in a sand tray. Right. And mm -hmm. so, I'm just going to use these like cool fidgets that we use sometimes with kids yeah. that are like super fidgety to kind of go, okay, we're creating this world and in non-directive, right? Mm -hmm. Kids are choosing the characters to mm -hmm. kind of play with or interact with. And what we, at least what I've found is it seems like sometimes they'll pull out themes, right? Like you said, yeah. like the police officer or someone that's an authority figure maybe a child has had kind of some traumatic experience with some type of authority figure, yeah. whether it is a police officer or a DCS worker or a parent even that is more 
um, and the kind of authority kind of mm-hmm. focus, right? Like this might, without giving any words, represent that to the child. And mm-hmm. so the child chooses that as someone that is, they're, they're needing to work through something with that, right? Yeah. I found that a lot of times kids, if we're working through something, they'll sometimes bury certain figures. Yes. Oh, Yeah. And so that is kind of understanding of maybe they're dissociating and they're mm. kind of trying to bury a memory yeah. deeper down yeah. subconsciously or subconsciously. They're not aware of that, but maybe there's something, there's figures or multiple figures yeah. that they're burying and maybe it's all over and you kind mm. of can see what is going through the child's mind and what are they experiencing? Mm, yeah. And so I love using sand for multiple reasons yeah. for, for that, but also for more regulating yeah. of just that, like you said, that mindfulness of let's practice some self-regulation skills and yeah. that grounding. Yeah. That could be so powerful with kids who haven't had that and they need some kind of some uh, regulating skills so we can work on that. And also building control and allowing them to just have their own autonomy Mm, to choose. Because sometimes kids, they don't have that. They've never, they had things taken away. They've had things, and this is their ability to choose what they want. To choose to have that control and to build that. And so that's why I love using non-directive because Mm. it allows kids to really work through wherever they're at but build that autonomy and that control. Mm, that's so good. Yeah. Yeah. Which we, yeah, we see is so often with, with kids that have experienced yeah. trauma yeah. very early. They're like, I'm not in control. And they I, realize this in an age that we normally don't. Yeah. And so I th- thank you so much for sharing just some of your toys. That yeah. we have. We'll do a little bit <laughs> yeah. of a show and tell here with this. So this is what a typical sand tray would look like. We have a variety of figurines. We have some little, little um, children. We have uh, a police officer or um, authority figure over here. We have, um, we have this one, looks like this one was um, maybe getting buried or um, something happened to this figure. Um, We have a bunch of figurines that are kind of spread out. So maybe we can maybe we could figure out why they're spread out or mm-hmm. the placement of the figurines. We see the the authority figure is really far away from the kids. Yeah. I wonder why that is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And even right, like even the idea of like there's some type of cage or some barrier, someone's being kept in versus yeah, people being buried versus like even the placement is un, yeah. like is yeah. representative of relationships and so oftentimes we see when when kids are playing right they'll be all in it and maybe they're climbing over stuff but then they'll stop and just kind of notice the yeah. feel of the sand going through their hands and then they might come right back and go okay so we're we're removing a cage and resetting up right and so this is their world which yes. will, they get to create Um, and you'll see certain themes. They might not say, this is the case manager, or this is a abuser, this is whatever. They might, they might just go through a theme and it's not always our job to connect it with a person in there, but letting them work through the themes and us understanding. Yeah. And so, and a lot of times kids are just having fun. I've had so many kids where it's like a, a kid like this might be a bully at school and he's being mean and he's hitting and going like this. But then a teacher comes up and tells him, no, you're in timeout. And so then they're going to put him in timeout over here. And then the teacher maybe helps or maybe there's a, a nice teacher or a parent that is or a grandparent that's going to comfort them. And so you see these different themes that really is helping them reinforce neural pathways in their brain for attachment, safety and security, or even things that have gone wrong and maybe how they would have wished they would have gone. Yeah. Right. And so, or maybe even they see themselves as the big bad person yeah. instead of they see themselves as I'm a bad person. Yeah. I, I'm a scary one in, in 
in here. Yeah. This is how I identify myself. Yeah. And it's so interesting. You'll see themes, right? Where, where all of a sudden the world will be set up and it will be from an individual's perspective. Like they, you will almost see them kind of identify yeah. with one primary main character, right? And so then you start to go, oh, maybe that's you, right? And then people will be uncovered and things will just be smashed or whatever, right? And it's all of it has such incredible meaning and processing power. Yeah. And so such an incredible tool using uh, Sandra. Yeah, that's why I, I think it's just so great and interchangeably for just regulating and then increasing those neural pathways and processing mm. through really heavy situations if yeah. they've experienced. For those of you out there that are kind of going, okay, I see my therapist or my child playing with the therapist. Um, one of the things I think I would encourage you to really do is just kind of ask the therapist whether it's before or after the session or whatever, right? Like kind of going, okay, so help me understand how this is helping my child and, and really helping the therapist, asking the therapist to help you to kind of go, okay, what's, what's working here? What is it doing and how can I continue this work yeah. even at home? Right. And, and so sometimes I think therapists have this great insight that's helping mm -hmm. a child kind of process the, a trauma or an experience. Mm -hmm. But then all of a sudden, like the parents are going, I, I don't get it. They just keep doing the same play theme over. And it's yeah. like, they may not realize, right. Like there could be some deep, significant themes that a child is processing without even talking yeah. about what happened to them two years ago that was traumatic, right? Yeah. And they're doing it through this. And so it seems like there is a very effective kind of uh, aspect to play therapy. Yeah, there is. And, and that kind of goes back to your earlier question of, are we just playing? Yeah. Or what... I see them just doing the same thing over and yeah, over again. Yeah. Am I just paying for them to play? And I think it kind of goes back to, to there's so much more. It yeah. looks like play to yeah. a child because yeah. that is where they're at. That's their natural medium. Yeah. But as therapists, we know it's so much deeper and there's something there significantly. And like you said, there is reasons why we maybe are playing the same thing over again. It's because there could be those are some skills maybe they need to work on. Or right. maybe there's a deeper traumatic event that is still so heavy to them. Yeah. And to them, it's super heavy. And maybe it doesn't seem as heavy to a parent, but to the child, it's super heavy. Yeah. And so the therapist and the way that I like to to meet my child is where they're at. Yep. So if it's heavy, then it's heavy. Yeah. It yeah. doesn't matter what it looks like to someone else. If it's heavy to a child and they need to keep working through it, then we're going to keep working through that. Right, right. And what you see is it's through the long run, right? Like they will yeah. work through it through kind of consistent dedication and kind of working towards those yeah. treatment goals. And so yeah. for those of you out there, if you're going, man, uh, I still got a lot of questions. Please check us out at ArizonaFamilyCounseling.com. Um, we, we have blog posts on there about this, but then we also have therapists like Megan who would love to support you. Therap uh, thank you so much, yeah. Megan, for being a part of this. Yeah, thank and, you. And uh, yeah, see you next time.